I have a wonderful electronic invention I want you to see. It, it looks something like this. Welcome to the CTO Studio. I'm your host, Etienne de Bruin. The CTO Studio is where we chat with CTOs building amazing products with incredible teams. Have you chatted with a CTO lately? Chris, welcome to the CTO Studio. <laughs> Thanks, Etienne. It's early morning. It is. We're, having, we're on our first cup of coffee. We are. Um, I've known you for 20 years now or five? Feels like 20, <laughs> but it's probably been closer to six. I'll never forget the first time I saw you uh, at SD Ruby. You were running the show, and I thought, man, that guy looks like a fighter pilot. <laughs> uh, sure. Tell us about how you got to being uh, a tech lead today, tech leader. Sure. Um, I've always had a penchant for technology taught myself how to program when I was a freshman in high school. Um, always just like things. I wanted to be an astronaut because technology fascinated me. Uh, that led me to the Air Force. That led me to flying and then to test pilot school. So I've always been, at least for the first part of my adult career, I was always involved in uh, testing technology, trying out new technology, getting to fly uh, new systems on airplanes for the first time or new airplanes altogether for the first time as a test pilot. So I've always just had a penchant for technology and also always looked to uh, apply technology to solve problems for people. I get tremendous personal satisfaction. I love how that. we just kind of flew over the fact that you're a test pilot. I was, yeah, for 15 years I of my was career. Always, so tell me something about test pilots. Do you, do you go up thinking that you could potentially not come down? Rarely would you ever. You would never take off expecting to have such massive problems that you would either have to eject or crash land or So die. what does a test pilot, so your, your mission to test airplanes. Yeah, airplanes, uh, systems on airplanes. You realize now airplanes are giant flying computers. There's millions of lines of code on them. So anytime an airplane that is controlled by software, a digital flight control system, a digital engine control system, fire control radar, anything that involves computer code, people can change computer code and make things do things better or faster. Um, people can also screw up and put bugs in code as we both well know. So the test pilot's job is to be the first person to go out and try this thing, whether this thing is a maneuver in the airplane, uh, whether it's a new software load for the flight controls, maybe to improve the airplane's uh, stall handling so it doesn't get into a stall. We go out as test pilots because we're classically trained to recognize uh, how airplanes fly, to be able to evaluate them from an engineering and a scientific mindset. And we have a lot of experience in getting out of situations uh, flutter or spins or you name something mm. that goes wrong with an airplane. We don't want the guy who's flying his first mission over a combat zone to discover something. We want to discover things. And and you're saying that you very rarely go up thinking that there's going to be such a huge catastrophe that something's that that you could die. I think that's the common misperception about test pilots, kind of reinforced by the movie The Right Stuff back in the 50s. We did lose a lot of pilots back then. Uh, the pace of technological acceleration was so great that the country was willing to sort of expend human lives to move uh, aerospace technology forward. Airplanes and people are obviously very expensive. People are irreplaceable. So in the test community, they go to great lengths uh, and have tremendous safety oversight and safety planning to plan out every possible contingency to run simulator missions for hundreds or thousands of hours before a person actually gets in an airplane or try something in the air, in the plane for the first time. So the odds of it going bad are very low, uh, and the pilots are trained to handle it. Things still do happen. We've, I've lost friends in test missions that went very, very wrong for various reasons. It happens super infrequently, fortunately, uh, and I think it's a testament to the rigorous engineering approach and safety-based approach that they apply to flight test now. And are you still buddies, obviously, with is there like a test pilot alumni? Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. I, in fact, my younger brother is a test pilot for Boeing in Seattle. He was just down here the last two days. He was flying an airplane uh, out of Victorville, flying around at 25,000 feet unpressurized. Uh, and he does that stuff as a, as a commercial production test pilot for Boeing. So he now works with so many of my friends, including a former roommate from the Air Force Academy who is a test pilot, uh, all up in Seattle, all at Boeing's flight test facility. So mm. it's a very small community. Uh, when something happens, we all find out very quickly, and we all kind of keep track with 
of one another. Do you guys have your own Slack uh, instance? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet, but that's a great idea. You should start it. There is uh, a professional society of test pilots called the Society of Experimental Test Pilots. And uh, so there is a formal organization that keeps people together as Do well. you, um, I mean, I, maybe I'll preload this if you have some sort of anecdote or crazy story that, you know, w the craziest thing that's happened to you while test flighting something. But, but that's maybe, I don't want to put you on the spot. No problem. Um, so uh, you gave a talk uh, a couple of years back, I think now, about uh, the analogy between um, uh, test flights and sort of how the Na the navy or the uh, the air force um manage their test flights program and you kind of drew an analogy with product dev do you remember mm -hmm. that yeah absolutely yeah that Can was you a, give us a little high fly uh, fly through i'm going to use a lot of flying analogies sure, sure. today yeah I, yeah i think you're referring to the talk i gave at seven ctos about the development of the u2 uh and the uh, how that paralleled kind of agile development now and the, the reason why it's the comparison, I think, is apt is there was, a, there was a known, stated, recognized need for a solution, and a solution that involved technology. And you had a very small, uh, very capable group of people who got together with some very basic requirements initially and came up with a design that, you know, it's now been 64 years since the design, initial design was developed, and the airplane is still flying today. And I think you, I remember you saying... They knew they knew the few things that were the non the non negotiables, yes. right? Yeah. And then, but that was like you know, if you could maybe say that was on one sheet of paper, and it, and it evolved into thousands of sheets of paper sure. as you guys did that. Yeah, they had a group uh, at Lockheed run by Kelly Johnson, the father of the U two and of the SR seventy one, uh, at the Burbank Skunk Works, uh, and they basically had a list of requirements from the CIA for a need to get intelligence over. Russia for the missile fields and the bomber bases, things that we didn't know about. This is before satellites existed. So they had a very uh, finite number of must-have requirements, and the rest of it was left up to the team to innovate and come up with solutions to that problem. And in the end, they came up with a single-engine airplane with a glider-like structure, uh, without an ejection seat, without a landing gear, because they wanted to make the airplane as light as possible, because each a uh, pound of weight equated <laughs> to two landing. feet of altitude. Yeah, so the pilots were supposed to take off with some kind of cart that the airplane would sit on and then basically belly flop onto the runway or some other landing surface. So the pilots weren't super enthused with that once the design actually came to fruition. They ended up putting landing gear in it, but because of that, it now has a bicycle landing gear with a main gear and a tail wheel, which is very unwieldy and hard to control, but it works and the pilots are trained to do it, but it saves weight rather than have a giant, you know, typical... Typical triple landing gear with a nose gear and two main gears. So you gears. said every uh, every pound what? Was two feet of altitude. So if they shaved a thousand pounds of weight off the plane, it could go 2,000 feet higher. That was the, the kind of trade-off they came up with. And obviously, the higher you get, the harder it is for other aircraft, aggressor aircraft, or uh, surface air missiles to hit the airplane. And that was the entire intent. The CIA sold the president on the fact that if the airplane was high enough above 70,000 feet, that the missiles simply couldn't get to it, and the Russians could do nothing. And that was the way they so, sold and, it. And, and, and the, so the height requirement was 70,000 feet? Yes. So that's basically twice as high as uh, Typical commercial. airliners. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, most airliners cruise around 35,000 feet, so basically double. Do you think that there is still, I mean, are we past those days where you can uh, uh, hide yourself through aircraft, or does it now have to be satellites? And I mean, with the, all the technologies that countries have, do you think you can still hide yourself through, you know? Yeah, that's why stealth technology exists. And it's, it's still a thing. I mean, it's still a thing. Okay. Yep. Now you have to kill me, right? No, no, you're, the, <laughs> you're completely safe at this level. <laughs> it's so funny. I feel like there's stuff I can't talk about. Oh, you can ask all okay, you want right. if I can't answer that. You can it, just I won't. say, sir, I can't answer that, sir. That's right. I am an American citizen now. Congratulations. So, are there things that you've you are, been with You are now part me? of the huddled masses. <laughs> <laughs> so, Chris, I mean, is there like a whole litany of things that you've been withholding from me that now we can finally talk about? Uh, sadly, there's not. <laughs> <laughs> Your status as a U.S. citizen doesn't change anything. Oh, man. Uh, so, flying the U-2 bomber, you've done... The reconnaissance airplane. Okay, the the U two reconnaissance. Yeah, people sometimes confuse the B two stealth bomber oh, flying B2, wing okay. with the U two uh, glider like jet 
Your okay, so the, playing, and, okay, then, so the, and then the Irish rock band is the yeah, other. Yeah, so I'm yes. a, obviously a diehard U2 fan. So that's U2. The airplane is a U dash two. Yes, and it's a U2 reconnaissance. It was all about reconnaissance. Yes. Now, did you? You obviously flew it. I did. And like ten flights, hundreds of flights. Like you know, too yeah. hard to remember. It was, I have about eight hundred hours in the airplane. So some of the flights were barely an hour. Some were over ten hours. So it. And I think Depends. you mentioned something about just the, the, the comfort inside the cockpit. They had to mm -hmm. shave so much off of just general, I think, I forget what you mentioned, but a couple awkwardnesses in the cockpit, right? Well, you're, uh, you have to wear a full pressure suit or a space suit. So okay. if you see the astronauts in there, at least in the shuttle days, when they'd walk out to the launch pad, they'd be in these bright orange suits with a big neck ring, a metal ring, and a strap down the front. And that's the same suit that we would wear because we're above 99% of the atmosphere. Uh, above 63,000 feet, all the gas in your body and your fluids will evolve out of solution if you're not pressurized, and that's called Armstrong's line. So if you're flying at 70,000 feet and you were to lose cabin pressure, uh, you would die very quickly and it probably would not be terribly comfortable. Um, you don't boil. It's not like total recall and the eyes bug out, but um, I don't think we've really tried to test that too much. So because of that, you wear a, a pressure suit, a full pressure suit, which is your own completely enclosed environment, which adds some complications to things like eating or drinking or going to the bathroom. So if you're sitting in an airplane for 10 hours, the odds are you'll have to uh, pee at least once while you're up there. I do know a guy who never did. He never drank any water. He never used the equipment in the suit to be able to do that. But uh, I don't know how he did that. But the rest of us mere mortals would actually have to drink. And so you have... Uh, various ways. You have a feeding probe hole in the side of the helmet that you can put a hard plastic water tube in out of a, a bottle for Gatorade or water, as well as uh, tube food. It's kind of like a toothpaste tube with minced up food, which is actually quite tasty. Um, and you just stick that in there. You can actually heat those those tubes up. There's a little food heater on the airplane, so you'd actually get some warm food in your belly. And, and because the thing is, you're, uh, you're spending a lot of time in the cockpit, right? Just yeah, waiting. Could be 10 hours plus if you have just to fly a long way and stay over a, a combat zone for multiple hours. Yeah, you could be up there a long time. So, Wonder, How does it feel to, to know that you're above enemy, ter like enemy territory, like you're, you can look down and you're like hostile? <laughs> well, you hope not to land down there. I can say that with complete certitude. I think I saw a, a news article recently of a Russian pilot who ran into trouble over and, Syria. Yeah, and then he committed suicide, right? Well, I think he was uh, killed by the people on the ground. By oh, the time okay. he got on the ground, the bad guys caught up with him. And okay, he, okay. I, th I, thought I, I thought the article mentioned that he took his own life. He, he may well have, but I, I would... Did you have any such uh, <laughs> instructions? Uh, as far as survival? Yes. Uh, well, as far as what to do if you were to be in that position? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we go through extensive training for survival. Uh, for For uh, survival, though, not for... All of it. Survival, Self -destruction. evasion, resistance, and escape. I, you know, we're, we're never told that the solution is to, to take our own life. Okay. I, I, I have a desire to live. I have a wife and a family and, and a great life, so I would like to continue no, that. that. So um, there's a lot of lore around that. Like in the days of the early U2 program, uh, that there was a cyanide capsule that the pilots were told to carry, and if they were to get <clears> captured, <throat> so they didn't divulge information to kill themselves. And people often faulted uh, Frank Powers, who was shot down May 1st of 1960, and captured by the Russians, later repatriated. Uh, but there were a lot of concerns about, why didn't he do it? And uh, why would he do it, right? Yeah, There's nothing yeah. that the Russians are going to do to him that's so terrible that, that he wouldn't someday maybe come back to the U.S. And he did two years later. So it, um, makes me, it makes me wish that, so I love that perspective, because it makes me wish that we could just replace all bullets in the world with like some sort of stun mechanism so that really, because really if you think about it, and I'm referring to Hollywood movies, oftentimes lives are taken just because the dude's in the way as you're trying to fulfill whatever it is you're doing, right? Like, yeah, warfare no, but, is a dirty but really business. really all you need to do is stun them for a little bit so you can continue doing what you were planning well, on doing. Perhaps, but if you imagine stunning your way through an <laughs> army of 10,000 bad guys and when they become unstunned, <laughs> now you're surrounded. I so that maybe that doesn't work so well tactically, but, I, I would, but I'm with you. Uh, thank you. I yes. think in the parallel universe, that's something I would be an advocate for. Or maybe just spray them all with ecstasy and they just totally love each other and they... Hang out and hug and kiss for a few hours yes. while you do your thing. Exactly. And then just you, get them out of the way. You don't right. have to permanently remove them. Sure. Just incapacitate them incapacitation. in some way. Incapacitation. 
Maybe just hand out Game Boys or something. I don't it know. Is. I mean, I, I think you're taking it a bit far, but yeah. that's kind of what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've gone a little far afield. The, par- the parallels, though, between the, parallel. the, the development of the airplane and, and yes. what we do in software development, yes. I thought were apt, which is why I drew that. Yeah, so I love, um, I love uh, obviously, we've had a couple of years now of um, co-organizing. I think you're doing it more than, I'm not that involved anymore, but... Um, Ruby community, any comments on the evolving of the Ruby community? Um, I know with Rails 5 now, right? Yep. Um, how, just any comments on what's happening in, in the Ruby community in San Diego? Uh, I'd say it's, it's still going strong. There's still a lot of people hiring Ruby developers and Rails developers. There's still a lot of projects that are getting launched uh, with Ruby on Rails. Uh, we have been, we've been doing the last series of meetings downtown to try a new location to see if that changes the dynamic and brings in a different group of people. Um, I'd say attendance is maybe down just a little bit, um, only because we've changed locations and it's hard for people to stay up with change. Uh, but I, the last couple of meetings we've had, we've had 30 plus people at the meetups, which is pretty typical. Uh, I know there's still a lot of interest. I think in general, though, in the kind of developer community of people that are coming up into the ranks now, that they look maybe at Rails as you know, older technology or uh, a stack that has seen its better days. Um, and I'm not sure if anybody who's actually actively developing on Rails feels that way, but a lot of tech now is about buzz on social media. So if some new JavaScript framework view or something gets a lot of play and people who are interested in getting into the community maybe go that route because it looks like the new hotness and very popular, um, maybe they go that way. And there's, a, there's so many options out there now. I mean, there are things like Crystal, and Elixir and Phoenix. I mean, it's not the way it was, you know, five years ago and certainly not 10 years ago, uh, where you had a few very clear choices of things to try. Um, I was talking to somebody last night who's been doing a lot of work in Django and Python. And so that community is pretty vibrant, even though I, I, I personally don't like Django and Python. I mean, I love Python the language, but as a web development framework, I think Django has a, a lot that it, it gives up relative to something like Rails. So I think the community is vibrant. I just think there's so many other things competing yeah. for attention that people can only really focus on on one or two things. I read time. an interesting perspective on that a couple of years back where uh, the, the author was proposing that by nature, when hackers, hackers like to do new things and yeah, solve absolutely. hard problems, as soon as it finds mass appeal and therefore becomes easily deployable or you know like you can quickly do something with it becomes you mean useful to a business <laughs> <laughs> useful to a business by nature uh the 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 the, the devs want to move on to something that is hard yeah. again yeah that's human nature i mean especially software developers love challenges like you said they love solving hard problems they love that kind of that instant endorphin rush of getting something to return the correct result especially with new technology that is is new and fascinating you don't know how it works you can actually bend it to your will to do something beyond hello world. I think uh, that's that's a very natural thing. Actually, I think that is one of the things that is is tremendous about being in this line of work is that the state and the pace of technology advancement and the variety of solutions to problems is almost never ending. Um, and I, that's what keeps me energized. I love as a as a technologist being able to go out and experiment with new technologies. Uh, and trying to keep my radar tuned to the things that are coming over the horizon that may be of use to me personally or in a side project or with my employer. Uh, I love that challenge. Yeah, and I, th- and I don't try to keep up with everything because it's simply yeah. you cannot. And yeah. you have to just accept that you cannot <clears throat> try all the things. Yeah, and I, I, and I think that uh, uh, as CTOs types, I think it's critical that we are constantly doing the little hello worlds, just at least fueling that curiosity around. And I wonder how... You know, I just I just opened up uh, my first little Rust project, and yeah. and and I, I'm not I'm not building a product or an app, or you know, I'm not thinking about revenues. I'm just yeah. like, hey, I wonder how this thing compiles, and let me go and try that. So, sure, I think we should constantly be doing that. Yeah, you have to because you may you have to keep your bag of tools filled with new sharp tools. You have some that are your go to standards, like if you need, just need to spin up a a CRUD app very quickly, I can't imagine using a tool other than Rails. It's just so fast and easy. And you can even get something that is presentable to humans uh, from start to finish in less than a day. Uh, But you also have to keep in mind that there are other problems that Rails isn't a great solution for. Something with concurrency or parallel programming or a lot of WebSocket stuff. There are other better frameworks out there. So I think as CTOs, we 
owe ourselves and the people we build technology for and build technology with, we owe them a, a longer view and a wider view. Absolutely. We need to take the time uh, to look at these technologies, understand them, see where they're useful, where they're not. If something has super sharp edges and can't be deployed easily in any production way, then maybe there's no good use for it. Uh, but if you're just trying to write a command line tool to do something clever, then have at it. Uh, I think I think those little isolated projects that actually serves your team, like, hey, uh, I think we should, like, uh, you know, Aaron Contora that day spoke about constantly helping with the tooling for mm -hmm. our teams. I think if we're actually contributing to that, we inspire people and we, you know, that, wow, they actually want to make our lives better. And they actually went and did it themselves. Sure. Secondly, the whole um, coding sort of what is on the horizon. So, uh, yes, production is focused on the now and customer satisfaction and deployments. But what if you could be the person who is just hacking away at, oh, I think I, I, I did a proof of concept and I just did it quickly and it proves that we can actually do this new tech. Absolutely. So, when I, um, uh, I want to take in a run up to what I want to talk about. Um, I want to just touch on your stint as CTO at the uh, the coding within the image. Tech, uh, sure. Tell us a bit about that. Uh, I was CTO at a startup that was based around the idea. It's kind of a steganographic approach. And steganography is effectively hiding information inside of other information. Uh, and the CEO had a technology uh, that he had developed as part of his PhD thesis to be able to take a digital image and embed information into that image in such a way that it could be extracted back out uh, digitally or visually. Uh, so you could have, for example, an image on a con package and with the app that had a, a camera uh, to get a picture of it, you could then take that image and decode the information that was buried into that. So uh, you can imagine uh, like a QR code, uh, but on steroids and where the QR code wasn't just restricted to black and white dots. It could be a full color image. You could have, you know, a thousand items all with the apparent same image on them, but each one of them would have a different ID or different code or different message embedded in them. So uh, that was a that was a fascinating technology that uh, was the mathematics were well beyond me, which is why we had the PhD applied math guys uh, working on that part. But building out the technology from original MATLAB models into uh, native libraries in C and C++ and wrapping that into an Android app and then into a Rails app, uh, the technology was, there were like seven or eight key technologies there, and it was an absolutely fascinating and project. And is, is the key to that um, just super, super simple? Is it mostly a, a shape recognition tech, or is it a color rec a differentiation tech? I mean, is when you scan the image, are you mostly, is, the, is it mostly the shape or the color? Uh, neither, actually. It's all about uh, transforming the image um, from one space to another space mathematically. You can take, uh, and I can't get into the actual technology because it was proprietary, but there are ways to embed information into an image that are effectively invisible to the human eye because it takes advantage of shortcomings in your visual cortex. And the, the CEO developed this technology specifically with this in mind uh, for covert communications for the government but he also had a license to be able to commercially uh, do something mm -hmm. with it. And it effectively encodes information in uh, various ways in the details of the image that are visually recognizable to a system that knows what to look for. Uh, but it literally takes that image and does some insane mathematical transformations. Uh, and I don't even recall the exact Amazing. details, but it's not color related. It could be black and white and it wasn't, I guess, shaped but do, in but, that. But do you have to, when you print the image, do you have you have to embed something in the image, right? You, you're printing and consuming the image, right? Uh, the digital image itself has the modifications made to literally to the pixels okay. uh, that are distinguishable by a digital decoder or through the visual part was very hard to get right. Yeah. And we, we did get it working, but it was a big challenge. We spent the bulk of our time trying to get the transformation of an image from a smartphone camera image into the the math, basically, and you can imagine there's a lot of issues. You need a, like a perfectly square image that's yeah, oriented properly yeah. and that has to then be processed. To yeah, I can imagine the, the sort of the manufacturing challenges around that. Yeah, that to me was fascinating because I had never done C++ programming. I had never done anything with MATLAB. I hadn't done anything with uh, OpenCV or any of these other image processing libraries. I had not built an Android app before. 
So all of those things I did in the course of the 15 or so months that I worked on the Open project. TV, I, I did a small project in that as well. It's a fantastic Crazy. library yeah. if you want to do anything with computer vision. Yeah. It's really the only way to go yeah. right now. So then you went from there to a uh, knowledge base, knowledge share company. Yep. And then you ended at um, uh, Fairway Technologies. That's right. And, uh, I, and, and those things are all fascinating, but I do want to talk about your project. Sure. So, um, so just to kind of bookend it, we started with you being a test pilot and you've mm -hmm. now created a fascinating technology, well, uh, uh, product around the same challenge with, with, uh, with air noise. Sure. Tell us about it. Uh, air noise is a project that came out of frustration uh, that I felt dealing with the San Diego Airport Authority. Uh, there is a huge project going on nationwide by the FAA uh, called NextGen. It's their next generation basically plan for the, the airspace over the continental U.S. Uh, the idea is to make the airspace more efficient, to get people where they're going quicker, uh, to pack more airplanes into the same physical confines we have in the airspace in this country uh, to make departures and arrivals in and out of airports more efficient, uh, to make airplanes able to uh, kind of have a constant descent, for example, down from their cruise altitude to the runway, uh, just to improve throughput and flow and reduce fuel expenses and time. So that was the idea, which is all great. They're, I mean, these are great advances. Uh, the problem we have currently is that the FAA's Im implementation of NextGen has concentrated air traffic noise over some very small areas and often areas that never had any kind of noise over their over their houses before. So you have people who never had airplane noise who now have all of the airplane noise because all the, the routing changes are all GPS based. So there's satellite navigation, the airplanes fly very precise patterns, you know, within meters of each other each time they go over a, a point on the ground. So people are now getting completely inundated. And there's been a very lackadaisical response uh, by the FAA and the local airport authorities all across the country, not just San Diego. Um, and part of the, the problem is that people who are now being basically inundated with noise constantly uh, don't have a way to really get the problem fixed. Uh, the only solution that they have, really the only mechanism they have to make their unhappiness known is to file a noise complaint with the airport authority. Uh, I discovered early on when people started complaining in my neighborhood uh, about the noise that the process for filing a complaint was onerous. It took five or ten minutes to file a single complaint for people who had airplanes over their houses every 90 seconds who wanted to be diligent about filing noise complaints. It just ended up eating up hours of their day. So in addition to the waste of their time, the frustration would mount, the emotional toll would mount, and the airport authority just seemed fairly indifferent to that process. In fact, they made it harder for people to complain after I got involved in the process. So my solution uh, was use technology to do the hard work. Use technology to identify the airplane that's bothering someone and to file the complaint for them. There's no reason why someone who doesn't know anything about airplanes should be expected to walk outside of their house at 11 o'clock at night, identify the type of airplane and the airline, the direction the airplane is headed, how high it might be. Because that was what was the information required on the form? In some ways, yeah. The, uh, the other problem was their system had a 30-minute delay because of the way the FAA provides air traffic data. They have to take it, scrub it, take out airplanes that they don't want people to see, military airplanes or other sensitive airplanes. So there's a 30-minute delay in the system. So if you have a problem where an airplane comes over your house, the way the airport authority implemented the system, or I should say where, the way their contractor did, you had to wait 30 minutes before you could file a complaint. So that delay alone would cause most people just to write off the system. So you're waiting 30 minutes so that uh, the flight you're referring to shows up in a drop-down or something? Exactly, or? yeah. Okay. Basically on a visual depiction of air traffic flying around on a map, which in and of itself is a challenge because the average person doesn't Absolutely. know enough I mean, about aviation and airplanes. You're set up to fail, yeah, 100%. If you, if you have thousands of hours of flight experience like I do, it's, it's very straightforward, but most people don't. And I, I felt like the deck was stacked against the people because this problem was not of their creating. The problem showed up overhead, just out of the blue, literally out of the blue yeah, sky. So, so let me summarize. There's a, a wonderful initiative by the FAA to, mm -hmm. to uh, optimize airspace and flight. So that means that the, um, the flight paths that never used to bother you are now all of a sudden appearing above your house. If in some cases in some they cases. shifted flight paths and al changed altitudes, so now the airplanes departing and arriving at an airport are now flying a ground track that takes them over 
neighborhoods that historically had very few, if any, airplanes over them. And now, because all of the airplanes are flying a very precise ground path, because of all the, of the airplanes are now over. So if you can imagine oh before, the airplanes maybe were spaced yes. out this way. So the optimization... If, if you live somewhere in there, maybe you got a few airplanes. But now, they're all <laughs> like this. So if you're in that spot on the ground underneath all of the airplanes, you get all of the planes. Not then There's no way in the FAA system to spread that air traffic out. So I felt that that was just unfair. The, all the burden and, and onus was being put on the citizens to solve a problem that they didn't create. And they were having to use systems by an organization that seemed indifferent to the problems and including in that the fact that uh, assessing noise on the ground was really had no play whatsoever in the FAA's determination of where these ground tracks should go. You know, noise okay. on the ground yeah. was, not a was not a consideration. So you, people just, people having to raise their voices over the sound of the jet engines was the only way to get some traction and get people in Washington and in local and state government to recognize that people were really unhappy that they had lived in their houses for 50 years in some cases and never had noise or now having constant noise and it's their quality of life was being destroyed. And people felt powerless to do something about it. The systems put in place for them to try to make their unhappiness known, to try to nudge the government to a solution were onerous to use. So it's literally all of the possible things that you could do to put someone in a position to feel helpless uh, and despondent, they literally did. So my solution was to uh, come up with a system that made it as easy, as fast as possible for people to file a legitimate detailed noise complaint and then get on with their lives. And I've had dozens of people who use the system tell me that it is a sanity saver for them, that they can press the button, file a complaint, and know that they've done something, and then they can move on with their day. Uh, and you know, there are people who have filed thousands and thousands of complaints because of where they're located and just the, the inundation of noise they have in their day. That is, that's incredible. So I wanted to go into, uh, so the way it works is you, you have this button, Yep. IoT. Yep, this is Wanna basically an, camera? an Amazon. Uh, Amazon makes oh, these little button. buttons, these little IoT buttons. Um, they come with a blue label on them. I have I got some stickers made to replace, uh, to put the Air Noise logo on it. Uh, I got this idea. There was a guy uh, who was in the news a year or so ago who uh, was very politically active, and every time the current administration did something he didn't like, he wanted to donate five bucks to the ACLU. And he would go, and he would type stuff into the web form, and uh, finally he realized there had to be a better way. So he basically got one of these buttons from Amazon and through the system that Amazon provides in the back end, he built a little piece of code that submits his information and credit card number to the ACLU website. So every time he got annoyed at something he heard on the news, he clicked the button that triggered the Amazon Lambda. Amazon Lambda would then donate five bucks on his behalf to the ACLU. So when I saw that particular news story, I thought, well, that could be the solution to air noise because it's just a Wi-Fi enabled button. Uh, when someone presses it, it's just a signal. Then you could take that signal and do something with it on the other end. So that's what I did. So many questions. So then, <laughs> um, uh, the, but, but what is truly uh, fascinating, so you have the, the IoT Lambda side. Right. Uh, but then you marry that with, with uh, flight information. Yes. So, if Southwest is coming over my house mm -hmm. and I press the button, what did you do to make sure that you identified that flight and sundry? Yeah, so that was the other part of it was the complaint from uh, the local airport authority was they used to previously accept emails. So people would just send an email saying, uh, there was a loud airplane over my house at 10 o'clock last night. Uh, and the airport authority was complaining they weren't getting enough detail to do anything. Uh, and which is uh, fair enough. I mean, it, that absolutely is, you know, if it's making work for them. Uh, but, uh, you know, the flip side of that is what, how much knowledge does the average layman have about what is happening over their house? They hear a loud noise. They know it's a jet. They don't know where it's headed, you know, who's flying it. They don't know that information. They have no way to know it. Um, so I, I actually built this to also help the airport authority to help their staff get the information they needed for these complaints to then analyze them and say, oh gosh, this airplane was a curfew violation or it was off course or it shouldn't have been that low. Why was it so low? Uh, those kinds of things. So there are sources of information out there that are publicly available. Um, there is part of this FAA modernization program includes equipping all airplanes uh, in the US with uh, a system called Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast, ADS-B. ADS-B is basically a fancy digital radio 
that broadcasts the airplane's position, altitude, airspeed, uh, its call sign, its tail number, all that this broadcasts information. broadcasts it from the airplane. From the airplane itself. And the idea is that if all the airplanes are broadcasting this information, you could network that information together and I'm in an airplane and you're in an airplane and we're both broadcasting our position. Well, my system could pick up your broadcast and see that we are maybe on a collision course okay. or... Uh, we broadcast our information so the air traffic control doesn't have to rely on ground-based radars, which are old and expensive. Yeah, so to one time, one time we were arriving at Senegal Airport on my flight from New York to Johannesburg, and Senegal, uh, the captain informed us that uh, the the ground control there was a power failure at the airport and there was sure. no air traffic control. Right. So what he explained to me was that all these international jetliners were helping each other land at the <laughs> at the airport. Okay. Is that what they would have been using is sort of this uh, or was it more like voice voice kind of like you go and then you go? Yeah, and- it was probably just the airplanes communicating uh reporting their position relative to the airport because the airplane systems still work. They could see that they are 10 miles away to the southwest for example. So the the United airplane could say United one two three. I'm ten miles southwest, turning on final, and so the other airplanes that are coming in behind him can all start to look and figure out. It's what small airplanes do, uh, small general aviation planes. When you go into an uncontrolled airfield, you make a broadcast on the common traffic advisory fre- frequency and tell other people who you are and where you are, so people can look for you. So mm. pilots are trained to do that. So that's a uh, that's. But that doesn't work so great when there's clouds and fog, yeah, and can't yeah. see each other. And uh, this system ADSB uh, would augment or replace ground-based radar, but there still has to be a system in place to receive the information and, and sequence traffic in. So uh, that system, though, is not encrypted. It's publicly available. There are several services online that you can tap into a feed. In fact, you can build an ADSB receiver with a Raspberry Pi and some software and an antenna for about $100. So part of what I did was I built two ADSB receivers. I put one at my house and I put one at a friend's house uh, in the hills above uh, La Jolla so that we could try to get ensure good coverage of the ADSB signals that are around San Diego Airport. So with that, now that I'm broadcasting that information and feeding it into the network, I then am able to query that same network. They provide an API that allows you to ask for uh, all of the airplanes that are broadcasting that signal uh, within a radius and altitude cylinder um, around some point on the ground. So that point on the ground would be your house, for example. If I know where your house is, and I know that you press the button, I know that I can then go and query that API for all the traffic that maybe is in a five mile, 10,000 foot high cylinder around you. So the idea was to try to get detailed information about the airplanes and include that with the complaint so that the airport authority had more information. Yeah. It also provides a completely independent set of data so that when people are complaining, they can see you know, who the airlines are or the airplanes and the altitudes and everything. Uh, because that information is not provided by the airport authority. If you just go on their website and fill out their form and put it in, you just get an email back that says, thank you for your complaint. Um, you don't have any visibility into the data that they have. You don't have no idea what they're going to do with it. You have no idea if it's just going into the trash bin. You don't know. And for uh, in this situation where it's a very contentious situation, um, having a secondary independent set of data that people say, we filed 75,000 complaints, you say we filed 25,000, clearly there is a discrepancy. Uh, so people ha- want to know what's going on and they want to be able to control that and air noise gives people that ability. And it's not just San Diego. So this is the other. This is where this thing has gotten way bigger than I ever anticipated. I, I built this out of need and not in a desire to start a business because I have more than I'm, enough to keep me busy. This is gonna go huge. But it's I've got it now in New York, it's in Los Angeles, it's in Seattle, it's in Boston, uh, it's in DC, uh, now, it, uh, Tampa. So, so let me, that's incredible, Chris. So let me ask you, so I'm a little stuck on the ADSB receiver. Um, is the, uh, the ADSB receiver is something that receives the signals from the plane. Right. And then you, so why do you still, do you, do you need to ping a public API for the ADSB data? So or do you do you ping your own servers right. for this data that you uh, get from your receiver? No, I ping the I ping the network. So if you can imagine, um, if you go to flightaware.com, uh, there is a map on flightaware of thousands of ADSB receivers across the world. Uh, North America obviously is a fairly industrialized place, so the U.S. has almost every corner of the U.S. covered. And, and a single ADSB receiver, my mine picks up traffic over LAX. It's just the signals are strong. Uh, and they're digital, so they're very easy to decode. 
Uh, so there's a network of these receivers all over the country, which is why I'm able to offer the service in other cities besides just San Diego. I put the, oh, so you don't so you don't have to ins, you don't have to, yours, no. okay great That's, no the, the reason I put the ADSB receivers here was to ensure and because it was also the first market that I tried it in to ensure that I had good data so I can look at my uh, I can actually check I can log into my Raspberry Pi and see the the virtual radar screen for my receiver okay okay uh, but and, I can't check other people's receivers I, and I don't really need to I just need to know that the data is being collected okay so that was your sort of um, Proof of concept. Yes. And was that is, is that what you were referring to with the seventy five thousand versus twenty five thousand complaints? Uh, where, or or, or uh, is that something else? No, I just I was trying to make the point that if if you're trusting a government organization okay. to tell you the level of complaints, we only receiving, received five complaints. That's right. We okay, have no, it, and it. that's and this actually happened. Los Angeles, in fact, uh, when the system went live in L A, uh, the L A World Airports responded by very stealthily blocking complaints from air noise because the number of complaints skyrocketed. It went up tenfold overnight. Uh, and they saw basically that the complaints were coming in from a specific IP address from the system that I built. So they started, they still showed on the screen, thank you for your complaint. It's been received and actually buried down into the HTTP response was a little message that said IP blocked. And so people were, they were actually lying to the citizens that the complaint was received Instead of actually dealing, if they felt they had a problem either with the data that I was being that was being submitted, or the volume of complaints, their reaction was to uh, lie that they were actually accepting complaints when in fact they weren't. So you can't actually trust these government agencies uh, to do the thing that you would think they're supposed to do. And if you understand the economic incentives, the San Diego Airport Authority is there to ensure the viability of the airport to increase the number of flights people want more flights they want to be able to go to more destinations directly they want the business they want the tourism it's all about the dollars uh, san diego's airport authority also has the last couple words of their charter says to maintain the quality of life for the people here in san diego so they've got things a little bit out of whack as far as doing that part so uh, i've been doing this as basically a watchdog as an activist as a citizen um, to try to make sure that those guys are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And it's happening all over the country. These New York City, they're doing it. And that organization, same vendor as LA, was blocking complaints. Those people got up in arms, had their city council people contact the airport, and they stopped blocking. But they blocked it because they didn't like the increase in noise complaints. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it represents an increase in their process. Yes. Just quickly, so you're shipping these things out on mass, hopefully. Yep. And uh, where can people go to see more information about this? Uh, airnoise.io. And uh, is there anything else that is inspiring you lately? <laughs> Books, podcasts, humans? I, you know, I, I, I find inspiration in so many places. I'm, uh, I'm not really sure I do. Uh, I get inspired when I go to the airport authority meetings and I see people who are uh, trying to fight this problem stand up in front of government officials and, and hold them to task. Well, That's inspiring to me. I love it. And I'm completely inspired by this uh, startup. And I full on believe that this is a product, a startup, a company, and you're going to just be, have to be honest with yourself at some point and say, oh, wow, I created a monster. Well, it certainly take on a life of its own. I can say that for sure. Yeah, I, I spend a significant portion of my free time now managing this. And, um, and that, yeah, that's a technology problem too. How do I make this thing more self-managing and where I spend left, less of my time yeah. doing it. But it's, uh, it's for a good cause. I've, I've met so many people, not just here in San Diego, but all over the country. Um, in fact, it was featured on a news article, a TV news in Nassau County, New York. And uh, the two of the ladies there who helped get it started, I had never met them before, but there they were on TV holding the button. How did they find you? The system. Uh, Facebook. The Facebook. Yeah, someone, Facebook, all these Facebook groups communicate and uh, not being a Facebooker. I was completely unaware that was happening and Crazy. people started reaching out to me. Chris McCann, thank you. Etienne, it was my pleasure. See you soon. Sure. Have you chatted with a CTO lately? Hi, thank you for listening to the CTO Studio. If you don't mind, take a quick second and please rate and review the show. It helps us a lot. Go to thectostudio.com for more information on what we're doing at 7CTOs. We also have a video or two for you that could be a helpful resource for you as you're managing your company. So thank you for listening.